Hello everybody and welcome to what's going to be an unapologetic gear video. That's right, a massive gear video because I have spent thousands of pounds on new video equipment, new video accessories and new photography gear and I'm going to go through all of that in today's video and hopefully answer the question, what is the best setup for lightweight hiking, video making and landscape photography? Because, <laughs> well, that's the dilemma I've faced. So if you're new to this channel, I do a lot of in the field videos, landscape photography, traveling, getting to difficult to reach locations, camping and all that sort of stuff. And what I've began to realize over the past couple of years is that the heavy gear that I carry, which is usually a Canon 5D Mark IV, three lenses, a video camera, which is the M50, a drone, a full-size tripod, all that sort of stuff. You know, that is fantastic. But when you're hiking for many miles, or even not even many miles, just so much short and steep, it just becomes problematic to the point where it can negatively affect your video making and your photography. So I am going on a trip shortly to Nepal, which will see me hiking long distances at high altitude. And I'm, ju I'm just sick to death of carrying heavy gear. So I have done a full overhaul and spent thousands of pounds. And I would, would just like to reiter reiterate that I have spent it. Nothing in this video is sponsored and everything was bought at full retail value, which means I pretty much can slag it off. But don't worry, I'm not gonna slag it all off. Just some of it. Um, so yeah, let's get cracking. What have I bought? Why have I bought it? And how is it going to help me in creating videos and photography for this channel? Well, let's start with the biggie. I've switched my Canon 5D Mark IV and Trio of L series lenses for a Fujifilm X-T3 with a kit lens, which is the 18 to 55, a 55 to 200, and a 10 to 24. So this is a crop frame, crop sensor camera, uh, which essentially means that these lenses are the equivalent of the ones I currently own, 16 to 35, 24 to 70, 70 to 200. Apart from it's not 70 to 200, it's something like 70 to 300 maybe. I don't know, I have to Google that. Now, what I would also like to say is that these are not the best lenses that you can buy for this camera. But you know what happens when you start buying the best lenses for this camera? Yep, the weight goes up and the size goes up. And the whole point of buying into this system is that it's small, portable, and lightweight. All right, so last week I made a video where I was testing some of this gear. I didn't really go into much detail, but let's very, very quickly talk through my experiences with the Fuji X-T3 for both video and stills photography. I've got some notes here, so let's just crack on. Uh, Fuji notes, okay. Uh, let's go through the bad stuff. Autofocus, this is on video. Autofocus, hit and miss. Um, that's with face detection on, and when I'm doing a piece to camera, I found that in some of the shots, it was hunting and losing my face. Maybe that's something to do with my face, I don't know, but I wasn't impressed. The problem is I'm coming from a Canon M50, which is flipping phenomenal. Like the autofocus on Canon's cameras are unbeatable. And I'm learning that. No flippy screen, goes without saying no flippy screen. <laughs> battery is so bad. The battery is so bad. It's so bad. Like I filmed 20 minutes worth of footage and took four photographs and the battery died. Now part of that might be because it's got no flippy screen, which means when I do a piece to camera, I have to record a quick five, 10 second clip, run into shot, check them in frame, come back out, stop recording, press play, watch the video back, and then go and record the full on piece to camera. Another test, another test. Maybe that's something to do with it, but still the battery is woeful. So I have purchased five genuine Fujifilm batteries. Hopefully that'll be enough. Does not remember two second timer. It's a minor thing, but on my Canon, if I shoot with a two second timer, which is pretty much all of the time, when I switch the camera on and off again and back on and whatever, it remembers the two second timer. With this, it always defaults back to single release. So I have to go into the menu or you know, whatever, change the settings to two second timer. Bit of an annoyance, but not a big deal. No option to change aspect ratio on preview. Again, on my Canon, I like to change the preview to, to different aspect ratios, like one to one, 16 by nine, four by three. It helps when composing my image. Uh, but with this camera, you can't do that. 
Well, you can do that, but it's a bit of a workaround. The only way to do that is to tell the camera to record both JPEGs and RAW files. And then when it's in that mode, you can then go in and change the aspect ratio of the JPEG to either square or 16 by nine, and then it will give you that preview. But the problem with that is you duplicating your image, you're shooting JPEGs and RAW files, which I really don't want to do. 18 to 55, which is this lens. <laughs> image quality terrible. When I took my first image in last week's video, which was a test run with this camera, I shot some beautiful autumnal trees in lovely soft mist. I shot it at 55 mil, which is the extreme end of this lens. I also shot it wide open at f4. That was a mistake. A mistake I wasn't aware of until I got back to my computer. My God, when I opened the raw file, I felt nauseous. The image quality was so bad, I questioned everything. It looked like it had been taken with a Fisher-Price camera or a Nokia 8210 phone. It was just awful. Um, and it turns out it's this lens. Basically, if you've got the kit lens, it is a great video lens and it's an okay photography lens, but don't shoot it wide open and don't really go past 35 mil. Image quality questionable. Uh, I'm being a bit fussy, I'm used to the 5D Mark IV. The image quality of this camera when not shooting with this lens at 55. So if I'm shooting with this lens, for example, the image quality is great. Uh, there is that horrible Lightroom worm effect, but that only comes into, you know, it only happens when you over sharpen your images. Um, and you don't need to over sharpen your images because there's no anti-aliasing, no, yeah, there's no anti-aliasing filter on this sensor or something like that. Uh, so you can actually pull right back on Lightroom's default 40 sharpening or whatever. So yeah, uh, you can reduce the sharpening in post-production and actually increase your image quality, which is very good. Sometimes the camera won't switch on. Can you imagine? I've got a brand new camera, this, played around with it, after about an hour, it just wouldn't switch on. It doesn't switch on, you have to take the battery out, put the battery back in, that kept happening time and time again. Actually, I updated the firmware and it doesn't seem to have happened since, but still, not good. All right, let's quickly look at the positives, because you know me, I love to talk about the negatives, but let's talk about the positives. Amazingly customizable, absolutely. Any button can perform any function and everything can be done with one switch of a button, one press of a button. So for example, when shooting video, you can go from 24 frames a second to 120 super slow-mo in like, like one press of a button, which is great. Another thing I was concerned with this camera because not only is it my main stills camera, it's also my main video camera. I'm a hybrid shooter. Um, and as you all know, the settings for both photography and stills are completely different, but with this, you can lock the video settings in. So you can switch from video mode to photography mode or stills mode and it will maintain the settings for the stills in one setting and maintain the settings for the video in the other. So you don't accidentally shoot your images at ISO you know, 3000 or you don't accidentally shoot your video um, <laughs> with a shutter speed of like half a second or something. Really nice to use, tactile, very, very tactile. Lovely, lovely, lovely camera, lovely dials, everything's just, it's, you know, it harks back to the analog days of film photography and just dialing in your settings, taking your time, slowing down. Oh, oh, this is a beautiful camera to use. Affordable, it is very affordable. Um, I bought this camera with the kit lens and I believe 55 to 200, so like one bundle. I think it was about 2,300 pounds, which actually is pretty good value because what this for what this camera offers, the price point I think is very, very competitive. Uh, versatile, very versatile. The video capabilities of this thing are phenomenal. Not great for vlogging, okay? Not great for vlogging, um, but for actual use, you know, capturing B-roll, capturing footage, filming other things other than yourself. Uh, amazing, yeah, the quality is superb. And then it's very versatile because you can quickly switch to landscape photography or sports photography or wildlife or anything. It, this camera pretty much does, does it all. Another thing I should mention with this camera is the L bracket. Look how nice this L bracket is. Is that not the sexiest L bracket you've ever seen? Um, it's by a company called Small Rig. I think I paid 75 pounds for it, which is expensive for an L bracket, but I wasn't happy with all of the other alternatives because they have a gap here. 
And to me, that would sort of question the integrity of the L bracket, and I, I didn't want that. I wanted a solid L bracket. And this was the next best option. Um, and I'm really glad I bought it. It looks really smart. It suits the camera with this wooden handle. And it just performs really well. It also has a neat little magnetic tool on the bottom for removing and tightening up the bracket. So yeah, you need an L bracket. And uh, yeah, this one I would highly recommend. Okay, so we're going hiking. We've got our camera shooting video and photography. Fantastic, but let's talk about memory and managing all of the files. Now you can buy these units, they're like hard drives, but you plug in your SD card and it backs up all of your footage. I don't have one of those. I don't think they're necessary. Instead, I've bought a ton of SD cards. Whoop, did it easy. Card slot number one records images only. Card slot number two backs up those images and records the video. So card slot one, images, card slot two, images, video. So what I'm gonna do is put a 16 gigabyte card in slot one to record the images, 64 gigabyte card in slot two to record the video. Every couple of days, I'll switch out these cards for new cards. That way, if one of the cards gets corrupt, I'm all, you know, I'm, I should never lose images and I might only lose a couple of days worth of video. Um, and that I can live with. Okay, so you might be wondering, you might be asking yourself the question, when I am taking those beautiful photographs over an epic mountain range, how am I gonna record the process of taking those videos? Well, you will have saw in last week's video, I shot with a backup, like a, a secondary camera, which is my GoPro Hero 7. It didn't look great in last week's video, to be fair, but that's because a GoPro does not perform well in dark woodland. It just can't handle the dynamic range. But out in the open mountains, this will perform much better. But one thing I wanted to do with this camera is have it look like it was following me like a drone or like a cameraman. You know, can I make this look like it's following me? The answer is no, it looks horrendous. So I did a bit of research and I found this camera. Oh yes, this is the Insta360 ONE X. This is a 360 degree camera. And the beauty of this is obviously you've got a 360 image so you can pick and choose your camera angle and your frame and you can you can add in camera movements in post-production later on so you can really give the viewer a sense of the environment that you're in. But this is great. This is called the invisible selfie stick. And you've guessed it, when the camera records 360, you can't see this selfie stick. So essentially you can walk with it like this over your shoulder or in front of you and it looks like you are being followed. It looks like you are being tracked by a drone or a cameraman and all you've got to do is pull it out, press one button, and it starts recording. And it's really good quality, you know, it's 5.7K, which means when you take out that one frame from a 360 sphere, that one frame should be 1080p. So that is fantastic, but there's a problem. There is the elephant in the room, and when I was researching this, there's a problem with this, and when I was researching it, I couldn't quite think of how to describe the problem to you guys. Um, and I sent a test video to uh, my good friend Gavin Hardcastle, AKA Photo Tripper. And if you watch his channel, you'll know that he's a little bit crass in a good way. And it was so funny because what I'd been thinking for days and days and days, he said in one WhatsApp message. <laughs> Oh, and he's just hit the nail on the head. He hit the nail on the head. He said, I like it, it's cool. <laughs> oh God, where is it? Where's my phone? <laughs> he said, and it's, if you've watched any of these videos, you'll know. And it says, uh, <laughs> it says, it looks great, but it looks like, <laughs> it looks like you're holding, <laughs> it looks like you're holding out your fist offering free wanks. <laughs> So when you have this camera in your hand and you're doing a selfie where it looks like you're being followed, it does kind of look like you're walking around offering people hand jobs. <laughs> offering people hand jobs. So that's one of the major problems with this system. It looks weird. Why are you walking around like this? It just looks odd. But don't worry, I have come up with a solution. 
The bottom of the invisible selfie stick has a quarter inch thread or something like that, a thread. Maybe it's an eighth of an inch, who knows? So what I'm gonna do is just fasten on a little clamp. I have this little clamp here, it's, it's not working, but anyway. <laughs> Basically, this is a clamp. I'm gonna fasten on the invisible selfie stick onto this end of the magic clamp, just like that. Here, I'm gonna attach this to my rucksack. The hip belt of my rucksack is really, really sturdy. So I can attach this onto my rucksack and then I can operate the 360 camera hands-free. Therefore, I can't be accused of offering people hand jobs when I'm walking around. <laughs> Now I'm really excited for the creative possibilities that this opens up. Um, it was about 500 pounds. Was it a waste of money? Time will tell, I'm not sure. But what I think is really neat is I can stand this up quite close to my camera when I'm taking stills and you guys will have the opportunity, or I'll have the opportunity to edit in lots and lots of different views and angles. So it should give for quite a good experience. It's lightweight, it's really small. So yeah, quite excited uh, by this. Okay, let's very quickly talk about power. This is an Anker power bank. I bought this, it was 100 pounds. It's called the PowerCore 26800 PD. Why did I spend 100 pounds on this? Because it's essentially one of the highest capacity portable power banks you can buy. And it has a power delivery system, which means it will rapidly charge this camera. I don't know if I'm gonna have access to power everywhere on the trail. So I've got this because there's no way I can run out of power. Um, so worst case scenario, I can definitely charge this camera from this many, many times and in fast time as well. But am I gonna recommend the Anker PD whatever 26,000 thing? No, I'm not gonna recommend it and I will tell you for why. This cost me 100 pounds. I thought that was quite expensive, but it's gonna be a good quality product. I will buy it, I bought it. I plugged it in to charge up the power bank. 24 hours later, the power level was the same as when it arrived at my house. Turns out that you've got to buy a special plug to charge this up. Guess how much for the plug? 45 quid, 45 pounds. That's 45% the cost of the battery itself just to make it work. Now what annoyed me wasn't the fact that you need a plug. It was the fact that the Amazon listing doesn't tell you this. I mean, okay, fair enough. I don't know much about electronics. Maybe I should have known this, but forgive me for being a simpleton. When I plug something in, it charges. It's just the way it works. Tripod, new tripod, old tripod. A tripod so good, I've bought it twice. This is the Slim, Benro Slim Carbon Tripod. I bought this one a couple of years ago, slated it because I said it was too unstable, but that was with the big heavy 5D Mark IV with the Fujifilm, it's fantastic. The reason I bought it twice is my old one broke. Not because it's shoddy, because I abused it as I've been using it for video for the past two years and I'm surprised it lasted this long. Super small, super, super lightweight and, you know, extends to a, a usable height when in the field. Okay, final thing, what is all of this gear going to be carried in? Oh, and here's the dog right on cue. Come on, say hello. Unfortunately, whoa, unfortunately he's not coming with me. Go on, get out. Don't come back. Okay, so what is all of this gear gonna be carried in? I did my test video in this low pro. I've had this for years, but I found it was a bit uncomfortable and I wasn't sure why. When I got home, I emptied the bag completely and weighed it. It weighs over two kilograms, something like 2.3 kilograms. I was like, that is ridiculous for an empty bag. I thought about taking something like my F-stop Tylopa. Again, it's a heavy bag. And because I'm gonna need instant access to my camera because I'm shooting video, um, it would be overkill. So I purchased this. This is an Osprey Exos 38. It's a 38 litre, super lightweight hiking rucksack. It weighs in at just over one kilo. And it's just phenomenal. It's the comfortable, the most comfortable bag I've ever had on my back. Super, super comfortable, fits my frame really well. Lots of airflow, lots of storage, lots of pockets. And when you look at this, because it's a lightweight pack, you know, versus something that would be twice the weight, you know, I'm saving like a litre of water a kilo, a lot of weight. So I did treat myself, I did spend, oh, what was this? I think this was about 100 pounds, maybe a bit less, just less than 100 pounds for this bag. Um, but 
worth every penny. I think this is really, really gonna make the hike so much more enjoyable and make the photography way more enjoyable as well. And that is definitely something to take into consideration when hiking and doing landscape photography. And of course, I mentioned this in last week's video. This is my little low pro, I'm not even sure what this is. It's a color top loader zoom 50 AW2. It's essentially just a small bag. Um, I'll be taking this strap off and I just have a little carabiner, just like Mr. Ben Horn. I'm gonna clip it on my rucksack and then I can access the camera straight away to shoot video. And when I'm not needing to shoot video, this will tuck nicely inside of my Osprey. All of this gear and more will be linked in the description below. Those are affiliate links. So just be aware that if you do click on them and buy a product, I get a small commission, but it doesn't cost any more. Um, so yeah, there you go. But uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna go. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching and join me next time. And I'm not sure what I'll be doing, but join me anyway. <laughs> All right, until then, bye for now.